Amen. What's up, y'all? How y'all doing? Y'all good? Yeah, good, man. Good, good, good. I was not overly convincing. I'm not going to lie. Y'all good? <laughs> All right. It's good, man. It's good. If you're mad at the people uh, that are at the lake this weekend, it's going to rain on them. If you're logged in, love you. We're not sorry, right? We're just not. So um, I'm excited about today. Uh, we're just going to dive in. I remember October 8th, 2015, it was an incredible day. We had our fifth kid in clear surprise on the way. It had been six years since we had another child. And we were back in the game. And I remember my, my wife was about, you know, roughly nine months pregnant. And there we were um, in the house. And all of a sudden my wife, man, she's the best. She just nudges me. She says, hey, baby, I think today's the day. And I wake up. I'm like, okay, what do we do? She's like, I'm good. I got a shower. You get the kids. We'll drop them. And we had, we've had four kids, y'all. It's not our first rodeo. We know how this thing works, right? So I'm like, you're the expert. I got this. So I, I get everything together. I head downstairs. And as I head downstairs, I see my wife uh, leaned over doing this. I'm like, everybody in the car now. So I call some friends. I'm like, hey, man, uh, we got we to gotta drop you. Uh, is there any way? And they're like, absolutely. And so we, we drop the kids, and uh, we're just on our way, man. I'm like, this is going to be a beautiful day. I know how today is going to end. We're going to be in a hospital room filled with doctors. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to be holding my fifth child, fourth son. Let's go. I'm ready. I literally pull out my phone. Don't judge me. And I take a picture. Son's coming up. I'm like, oh, Lord, this is a good day. About that time, my wife said, you need to hurry now. She got a little single tear. My girl is strong. And I'm like, oh, this isn't good. Because in my mind, I'm thinking no matter how fast I drive, we are about to hit rush hour in the city of Louisville. And I got a girl that's about to pop. So she starts breathing quicker. I start driving faster. We're passing everybody. We make it to the highway, and I'm like, we got to go. So I'm, I, I am embarrassed to tell you how fast I was driving. But I'm telling you, I am breaking my own laws of what's right and what's wrong. But I am going to get this little man to be born in the hospital where he's supposed to be. My destination is secure. So we start driving. She's breathing. She's now crying. She squeezed my hand. I have a permanent mark if you want to look later from her fingernail. But as we're driving, we finally get to this place. Maybe you know this place where it's 64 in the Waterson. You know. All four lanes deadlocked. And I pull up and my, my girl puts her arm on me and she looks at me, tears in her eyes. She said, baby, whatever it takes. And I'm like, you got it, girl. So we're in the grass. We're on the side of the road. We're driving over stuff. Like, I'm just like, I am going to get where we need to go. And about the time we're up on the water, and kind of moving, you're like on the ramp to get over, in my mind, I know it's on me, but I just thought to myself, how have I not popped a tire? The thump, the thump, the thump. I see the tire pressure gauge, and I'm like, no, 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 no. So we start driving, and as we were around, we just got one exit. I mean, we got, I'm honking, I'm flashing, I'm waving. I, I'm like, come on, man, we got to get there. And as I'm doing that, we start to, as I start to make it onto the exit to the hospital, I start seeing smoke billow out of my engine from my car. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me, man. So I pull into the hospital, and I pull up. I don't know if you guys have these little things where they have, like, the, the little people that park cars outside have you seen this at hospitals with babies? And so I pull up and this teenage boy, I scream up, tire flat, smoke rolling out, the door opens, and true story, my wife's water breaks on the sidewalk. And this kid looks at me, just fear in his eyes. He's like, we don't have wheelchairs. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have wheelchairs? It's a hospital. So I look over and there's the emergency room and I'm, I'm just, I just, instinct takes over. I just start running for the emergency room. I run into the emergency room. They look at me like, who is the crazy man? I grabbed a wheelchair and just ran out the door. <laughs> and so now I've got these nurses, these ER people chasing me. Where are we going? I'm like, my wife. And so we wheel her, we put her in the chair. We turn around, they start taking her, and I, and I turn around, doors open, water on the ground, engine smoke, and a flat tire, and I took the keys. I said, I'm so sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and so all of a sudden, then I'm like, I turn around, and I don't know where they've taken my wife. Men, we don't know the, what, what happens at these places. So I turn around, I walk in the room, true story. And as I walk in the room, and then there's an elevator, and it's packed with people, and I'm like, I'm, like the words aren't for me. I'm like, where are they? Where is my... They don't know my wife. Where do they have the babies? 
Somebody's like, third floor. I'm like, okay, I push the third floor. I get up there. All of a sudden, I hear my wife crying, trying to explain things to the triage nurse. It's not even labor delivery. And I literally go over there, grab there, and they're like, where are you going, sir? I'm like, I just wheel her into a room, and within 30 seconds, I have delivered my son on the table in triage. I'm like, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay, this is okay. Now why do I tell that story? Because I'm just telling you, um, there are times in your life when you just gotta do whatever it takes to get to the destination that you know is the destination that was made for you. Ain't no way this brother's gonna deliver that little nugget on the side of the road, it's not happening. Like I'm not doing that. And so somehow, in some way, it's this, it's this weird thing we're gonna talk about when life goes off the rails, and here's what happens with life. Life just ends up not going the way you planned. That's the way life works. So then what do you do when it gets off the rails, and how do you deal with these competing desires in your life? My wife and I, how do we, dise- like, I, I promise you, this is probably not true for you, but my wife usually has an opinion about my driving, But her desire to get to the destination trumped her desire to talk about my driving or care how fast I'm driving. Like when you know your destination, all of a sudden the desires that are going to get you where you need to go start to come in line. But you also know that desires can get you off the rails. Like your desires. Some of you are here today and you would say, my desires are the one thing that I can't figure out in my life and my desires keep taking me to a destination that I don't want, man. They keep wrecking me, they keep, like my desire to be loved, my desire to be seen, my desire to be successful, my desire just to to be in the middle of the action, my desire, like I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, Matt, my desires, if there is one thing that has train wrecked me time and time again, it's that I can't control my own desires. So what I want to do today is I just want to have a real conversation. And there's this symbiotic relationship between desire and destination. Destination is the place we want to go. And desire is, the, is like the fuel or it's like the keys or it's like the vehicle that can get you to that destination. But the wrong desire, the old desire, will get you to the wrong destinations. The right desire, the godly desire, will take you to a destination that's better than you know. So here's what I want to do. I want to talk. We're in the book of Colossians. We're talking about off the rails. And so I just want to unpack Colossians 2, uh, verse 9. It's probably the clearest, 9 and 10, it's probably the clearest passage in Colossians that kind of defines what it is that Paul's trying to say to this church in Colossae whose desires had gotten off the rails. So he just says to them, he says, hey, listen, and I I think this is true. I, I think he's saying, hey, you have a destination problem. So he just says to them, uh, starting in verse 9, he says, For in Christ, all of the fullness of the deity, talking about all all, all of God and who he is and his character, his nature, and his love and who he is. It was a little confusing in the Old Testament, but because of Jesus, all the fullness, if you wonder how God thinks or acts or feels about anything, all you got to do is look at Jesus. He says, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And then he says this amazing thing that should change everything for our lives. He says, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So you're like, well, that doesn't seem like a big phrase. Well, the the word fullness is this Greek word, plerao, and that Greek word, plerao, means that you have been filled to the measure where nothing is lacking Meaning you're so full that nothing else good will fit in you. Like I love sushi. Sushi people. Yeah, there's there's two types of full for me. There's full with any other meal and I'm like, I'm full. That means ah, dessert comes out maybe. But full for sushi is like if you put another piece of sushi in my mouth, I will explode. There's a kind of fullness that the Father has for you that's so full. That literally, if we bumped into you, it would spill out of you. Like you would have no lack, no lack in your heart, no lack in your mind, no lack in your body, no, just no lack. He has a fullness reserved for his sons and for his daughters. And in Christ, you have, we have been brought to fullness. But here's the problem. I heard a woo. Hey, come on. 
Y'all, know, you're, y'all are like, that sounds amazing. And some of you have tasted little pieces of that. I've tasted a little piece of that. But the reality is sometimes in this Christian life, we recognize that we're not getting to the, anybody not getting to the destination we thought. It's like, man, I, I, I'm trying to live this Christian life, but I'm just telling you, I'm trying to shape my desires, but my desires aren't getting me to the destination. I keep feeling like I'm running into four lane traffic and I'm not sure, do I go, do I stay, do I stop, do I move? Do I, do, I, do I hop on the side of the road? Do I, what do I need to do to get to the destination? If fullness is on the table, and it is, and we're not getting to that fullness, then we have to take a step back and go, then let's examine some of our desires. Desires aren't inherently bad, right? Passion is a good thing. We all wanna live a passionate life. It's what drives the car of our lives. So let me just throw one out, for example. So like a desire to be safe, is that a good desire? Like, kind of, right? Like if I'm downtown or if I'm in some shady part and a desire to be safe is a good and a holy thing. But if your desire to be safe is keeping you from really reaching into new relationships because you've been wounded, if you're living your whole life playing it safe and never really sacrificing for the kingdom or figuring out what it means to just extravagantly give because you have to trust in God, then I'm just telling you, then that desire to be safe won't get you where you think it'll get you. Your desire to be successful, is that bad? No, man, I want my kids to be successful. I want my kids to, when they walk in a room, know how to shake a man's hand. I want them to know how to speak up with authority. I want them to know how to lead and to leverage their lives so that they can leverage whatever it is they have for other people and not be about themselves. But you all know that while a desire to be successful can be good, if you examine that desire for a second, is that how everybody uses it? Because some of you know that desire to to be successful is what has driven some of our friends and some people in the room to be workaholics, to always be focused on the exterior, to be packing their lives. Like their, their hearts aren't full. They're trying to use their success to fill an empty hole in their chest. And you keep watching from the outside and you're like, dude, no matter what business you run and no matter how much success you have, it cannot fix your heart. That desire that you have is not getting you to the destination that you long for. Our desire for our kids to be successful. Is that a good thing? Well, yeah, man. Of course it is. But have you seen dance moms? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Anybody who has seen this show, if you haven't, don't watch it. It will rob your soul. It is a bunch of moms vicariously living through seven and eight year old daughters. And it will make you go, this is what's wrong with our world. <laughs> But you see it closer than that. You see people, some of you have experienced it. The only encouragement you ever gave, you were given was when you were good at a sport, when you looked good, and when you made your parents not embarrassed. And I'm just saying, is that is a desire for our kids to be successful good? Well, sure, as long as that desire isn't really just trying to get you to a destination of looking good, and I'm a good parent, and I must have done something right. So you got to examine those desires, your desire to be married. Some of you are a lot of single people in the room today. I know that. You're like, man, is a desire to be married bad? No. Is a desire to be in a community and to, and to have an identity and to be loved and to be a part of something bigger? Is that bad? No. But have any of you seen somebody in their desire to just be married? Instead of waiting for the right one or, or recognize what God's doing, they, they just, that desire to be married turned into a desire to just not be alone. And then it drove them into the relationship that they never should have been in. And they should have never gone there and they should have never partnered their life and their mind and their soul with that person, but they did. And now their heart is more broken than they ever. And it certainly did not lead them to the destination that they really longed for. So we gotta examine them. We gotta look at those desires We can't just say, well, is this good or is that good? We gotta really lean in and say, okay, there's this symbiotic relationship between destination and desire. That was true for the early church. Paul writes as a father kind of to a group of people that he just loves and they're more like us. I was just in Turkey just recently in the city of Colossae and I see you tell you, they're just like us, man. Family meant a lot. 
They were a bunch of business people, entrepreneurs. They had a lot of like synergy with relationships and, and they're so much like us. But he looks into the church in Colossae. In chapter two, he just starts speaking to them as a father and says, hey man, listen, I need you to examine some things. Because what I'm seeing is your desires that you're acting on will never get you to the destination that you were made for. He says, one of those is just the empty way of the past. He says, hey, hey your, your desire, I know that you've accepted Jesus, but you still in your heart have a desire and a fixation to do the old things. So yes, you're a Christian, but you kind of like college version of you. You still, you, you, you kind of, you like look back and you're like, ha, ha, man, I love old me. Old me was great. Man, old me was crazy, man. And that guy was, you know, he just did what he was going to say. You know, he was just, oh, he was so awesome. Old me was awesome. Isn't it funny? It's like, it's like women who have children. You forget how bad the birth was. You know what I'm saying? You're like, do you remember you back then? You were a terrible person. And who you were becoming, what it was doing to your soul. But he says, listen, some of you have a fantasized version of the past, and that is your desire. And in, if I'm being honest, yes, you're a Christian. You just want a little forgiveness, and you honestly just want the destination of how you used to live. And you forget how much it killed you. He says, there's this other thing. It's a big word, and I'm sorry for it, but it's just, it's, it's helpful. It's this thing called syncretism. He just says this, he says, listen, um, some of you have these destinations of just one in the old past, you just wanna hold on to it, but some of you, it's like your, your, your desire, your desire to just like, like change and make things happen has is, is, is just started making you really weird. Here's what that means, like you, you're like, yes, I'm a Christian, but I need to speed this thing up a little bit, so I'm a Christian who reads in my horoscope, who, who has new age crystals in my house, who, you know, literally like, you just have all of these like mixing of cultures where you're like, yes, Jesus, and yes, I want you to help me you know, pick my partner, but I'm still gonna go to club because that's where you find them. He says, listen, man, you're mixing. You're mixing these things that don't mix. Like if, if, if you think that it's Jesus plus the palm reader, you don't understand Jesus. So he just says, man, listen, man, that, that desire to just get things fixed isn't going to get you there. There's a better destination that I have you for, legalism. There's a lot of people, and they're, they feel like, okay, if the destination is we're going to stand before God, then right now my desire is I got to make my case, man. Like, I got to make sure, like, okay, I came home and I yelled at the kids. Well, I wasn't awesome, so I need to be really nice to the waitress. Well, we're not doing this. We're not trying to, by the end, like none of the gospel was ever about you measuring up when you get to the end. That's not how it works. And your desire for this will not get you where you want to go. It's actually going to entrap your soul. He says another thing is false worship. At the time, they were worshiping angels. I know that sounds crazy, but they would put their faith and trust in angels. It's not like they didn't believe in God, but they needed, they needed somebody to take them to God because they couldn't understand it. So they would pray to angels and talk to angels and do like weird little like ceremonies for angels. And it seems crazy until you see the way people follow popular pastors now. And it's like they, they don't really wanna just follow figure out and put their heart and mind into following Jesus and opening scripture and being dependent on the spirit. They're just always looking for somebody to kind of break it down and they have no theology and they don't know where it goes, but they're like, he seems good enough. Maybe he'll get us there. It's like, well, bro, it doesn't work that way. There's this thing called asceticism. Asceticism, you've probably, if you remember like the old monks, like whipping themselves and beating themselves, you're like, we would never do that. And you know, but we would try to punish our bodies into transformation. So I don't know how you grew up, but anybody grew up with like the don't drink, don't chew, and don't date girls that do? Anybody but me? <laughs> anybody ever heard that before? How many of you grew up and you thought dancing was a sin? Oh, you are lying. Yes, you did. Like, I remember, you know, they were like, dancing's wrong. I'm like, why? Because David? And they're like, well, you know what it leads to. And I'm like, I don't. But <laughs> asceticism 
is this thing where you're like, man, I really wanna change, I'm not getting to the destination that I want, so then I probably just need to add more rules to my life. I need to not go out, I need to not see people, I need to not drink, not smoke, not, and, and, you know, those might be bad ideas, I'm not saying that. But if you're using your desire to do because you think that's how it gets to you there, and he just, Paul would just say, it's not how it works. And the last one is just powers and authorities. And some, some people aren't getting to that destination because they recognize like I have an addiction, I have a darkness inside of me that man, even when I try, I can't overcome it and I keep trying to do it on my own, but I feel a darkness that I can't face and I don't know what to do with. And Paul would just say, hey, listen, man, it's because you can't do it on your own. Like you need the power of Jesus to free you from the chains that you're in. So he says, listen, um, we gotta pay attention to these desires and we gotta look for these destinations. And so I just... So then how do we do that, Paul? Like, how do we do that? Like, help me understand how to weigh my desires and get to where it is. I want to get to the destination, fullness, full heart, full life, full mind, full body, full everything. I want the fullness of every full thing in every full way. That's actually what the word shalom or peace means. It's what's promised to all of us. So Paul just says, well, so well, let, me, let me help you, man. He says, three, verse one, he says, since then... Since we have all this stuff and we don't know where our desire is going to take us and we, we keep landing in destinations that we didn't plan for and they're not the things that we see in Scripture or promised by our Savior, since then, he says, you've been raised with Christ. He says, hey, listen, we're not just doing natural things around here. We serve a God who's supernaturally resurrected from the grave and he raised you too. He has a promise inside of you for power and for hope. He didn't just die on a cross so that we would all recognize, oh, God's not mad at us anymore. He resurrected from the grave because he wanted you to know and he wanted me to know that now you have power. You have power of the Holy Spirit. You have access to the Spirit. The Word now comes inside of you and makes you alive and you can now be a resurrected person. Impossible is now possible because you've been raised with Christ. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Here's what he says, set your heart on things above. Where Christ is seated, can you see him? He's up there, he's seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthy, earthly things. And he just says, hey listen, if you're really gonna walk into fullness, then you're gonna have to set the destination of your mind on heaven. And how heaven sees you, and how heaven sees your your future and your heart and your life and you're gonna have to shift your perspective because the fullness that has been given to you is settled, it's done. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, there is a time. The word predestined is only used two times in scripture. Every time, there's a lot of talk about predestination. The only time it's used, it says, you have been predestined to be conformed into the image of the son Jesus. Your transformation is God's highest priority. We talk all the time about the one thing that Jesus promised to build was his church. What does that mean? That means you. It's not a building, it's us. And he wants to transform our souls. He wants to change our desires. He wants to move us to an, the destination that he longs for us to be. And here's what is secure. In this life or the next, you will be transformed, men and women, into the image of Jesus. Full heart, full life, full relationships, perfect relationship with the Father. That's on the way. So now he says, what I, want you to, what I want to help you with is that that destination that is going to one day happen is available today. How? Well, he goes on. He says, well, verse 3, you died. You're like, no, I didn't. He's like, you did. Remember your baptism? The baptism is when you confess in front of people that he is mine and I am his and I put my faith and trust in him. I'm gonna bury my old life as a symbol of death and I'm gonna raise to a resurrected life because of the resurrection of Jesus. That's what that was. And he says, you died and now your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Your destination is secure. We don't have to talk about it. It's done. If you're like, well, I haven't done enough. Well, yeah, me neither. We've been saved by grace through faith. Our destination, if we put our faith and trust in Christ, we have a heavenly home and we have a heavenly relationship with our Father right now. 
So he just says, so here's what you need to do. If that's true, he says, verse five, then you're gonna just need to put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature. And he starts listing out a list of the desires of the church in Colossae that just need to go bye-bye. So we all have our list, this is their list. He says, listen, he used the word put to death. It's, it's, um, it's kind of a violent word. I didn't, you know, he's kind of a pacifist, but he's, he's serious about sin. Um, he's like, hey, you need to put to, to death, therefore, whatever belongs to old you. Like old you, old you that used to react that way and think that way, old you that used to have those desires and those needs and those, like you just need to have, you just need to have a ceremony, you just need to wrap up old you and you just need to put old you in a box and just bury it. Because old you is killing you and old you can be gone. He says, but what you need to do is you're gonna have to, but we're gonna have to deal with those things that were taking you to a different destination. And the only way to deal with things, the only way you can deal with your sin is if you name your sin. So he says, so let me name it for you. You guys are dealing with sexual immorality, you're dealing with impurity, you're dealing with lust, you're dealing with evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. He says, you got all this stuff going on in your life and you know it, man. You know you're a Christian, but you're still holding on. You know you're a Christian, but you're still, you're still reaching in. He says, so let's just, let's, just, let's just name it. What are the desires that are holding you captive and pulling you to a place that you don't wanna go? He's the one that's gonna have power for it. All you gotta do is name it. What is it? What is that thing? We talked about it earlier. What is that thing? What is that desire in your heart? that feels like it's trumping the plans that God has for your life. He says, you need to put it to death. Verse six says this, says, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. And I don't know if you read that before, but when you read that passage, do you feel like, oh, dad just came home, we're all busted. Anybody? Wrath of God, who reads wrath of God on the page and is like, I love that about him, he's so wrathful. Right? You're like, uh-oh. So I had a former Special Forces Vietnam father, and when dad got home and stuff wasn't done, it wasn't good, man. And so I just say this, um, and I could be wrong, but for this picture of what we're building in the new, I think this is really important because the wrath of God is coming. What is the wrath of God, Matt? Well, here's my opinion. Romans 1.18 says, if you read it through, it says that the wrath of God is being revealed. That's what Romans 1.18 says. The way it's being revealed, and I think I can make a case all through scripture on this, is Romans 1.24 and 26 says that God gave them over to do whatever they wanted. See, sometimes in life, this is my opinion, I think that we think that we're like waiting for God to step in the room because when God steps in the room, then we're all busted and he's gonna be mad and he's gonna pour out. But what's interesting historically and when wrath comes on God's people, it's not him showing up with anger, it's him removing himself. And we finally are left with the absence of him and that is the wrath of God. When, when, when our God and King steps out of the room, everything falls apart. Do you remember those times where he was zero part of your life and you so wanted to do your own thing that he finally just said, okay, what happened? It all fell apart. I think there's a day coming where he is going to, because people don't want him and won't choose him, he is gonna remove his presence and it's gonna be the worst day that that humanity has ever seen in existence. But he's... but it's not because he's in the room and mad, it's because we all so desperately need him in the room more than we know. So verse seven says, you used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived, but now you, gotta, you just have to rid yourself of all these things like anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. He says, listen, don't lie to each other since you've taken off the old self with his practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its creator. And and, and Paul just says this, and I just want to walk through this really fast. Paul says, you know old you and new you can't coexist, right? Like old you, you're like, well, you know, old me is not that bad. I'm like, but you know like this, 
you can't be old you and walk in and say what some people say and maybe you've said to your wife and then turn around and go into the living room with your boys or your daughter and just be like, oh, God sees you and loves you. No, they just heard you. And he's like, you can't lie in this room and then speak truth in this room and be believable and be credible. That's not who you are. You're using the old desire, you're giving into the old desires and it's robbing you from the new desires and the new destination. And he's like, you're never gonna change until you start recognizing the only way to put the old to death is to have such a desire to live out the new that nothing can stop it, not four lanes of traffic, not stuff on the side of the road, not a flat tire, a broken engine. You are gonna get you and your family where you know you were made for and nothing will stop it. So I just, I, I, I just tried to break it down. Well, new what, Matt? Like, what, 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 what do we need? Well, you're a resurrected person. So I think the scripture would say, so, so here's what's true about you now. You have a new heart. Did you know that? Like Ezekiel 36 says, I will give you a new heart. This is a prophecy about when Jesus comes and what's gonna be available. I will give you a new heart. I'm gonna put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. You're like, well, my heart's not that callous. I wouldn't say a heart of stone, wouldn't you though? Am I the only one that my heart can get a little callous and I can lose my passion to follow him? I can lose my passion to just be a good dad and a good husband and a good friend? Am I the only one that just gets bored and distracted and checked out? Am I the only one that feels like sometimes my wounded heart keeps my heart from really doing and being what it was made to be because my heart has been broken and, and, I, and, I, and I just can't trust people that it just keeps my heart from being full? Am I the only one? He just says, hey, listen, man, you have a new heart. Like the battle for your heart is the battle. He says, I wanna give you a new heart. I want, it, I want it to be full of passion and full of desire. And the old heart is gonna keep trying to get you filled in the wrong way with the wrong destination, but I have a new heart for you, Matt. Will you receive it? The kind of heart that when people run into you, they just bump you and it just spills, man. You just, it's just love and it's just peace. It's just grace and it's just kindness. Like that's what my spirit wants to do in you. Will you allow me? to give you a new heart. Not just a new heart, all the feelers in the room are like, oh, he's always talking about the heart. So let's talk about the body, the body for a minute. It's not just a new heart, it's a new body. It, it says, uh, Ephesians 4, 22 says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. It's for you, it's not out of some rules. It's because new self is so good, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, to be created like God in true righteousness and holiness. And I think what Paul would say is, I think what's true, your body tells a story. You know that, right? Like your body, every room you walk in, it's telling a story. It's like when... Like old you, the story is, well, you know, I, I have these hands and these hands are telling a story. I can tell you the story because I go to restaurants and I watch couples that haven't been spending any time with together and they're finally at a meal and both of them are scrolling through their phones instead of having a conversation that would heal their relationship and make them move forward. They're scrolling through stock stuff instead of walking into the room and having a conversation with their son that they need to have because the distance is there and they've never prayed with their son and they don't feel like they're good enough. So I'll just go medicate on Netflix with my eyes. I'll scroll on my phone. I'll walk into rooms and I'll be busy and I'll go outside or maybe I'll go golf because I can win at golf. Your body tells a story. And he just says, hey, listen, man. Those hands that were idle, those hands that just wasted time, those, those, that mouth that avoided a conversation and tore people down, those eyes that objectified every single thing that they saw, that mouth that just did nothing but tell crude jokes and talk about sports and things that don't matter, and you've never really learned how to speak courage into somebody's soul, and that's why your home is vacant, and that's why your relationships are vacant, because you've never used the new tongue in the new way, and he just says, listen, man, you are, you are, not, a, you are not a thermometer, you are not saved and bought by the blood of Jesus so you can walk in every room and whatever is going on in the room, you just become the room. If, if, it's, if it's your family and there's a bunch of weird dynamics, then you're locked up. And if, you, and if your wife is mad, then you're quiet. And if, and if things are going wrong with your kid, then if they're mad, then you're mad. You are a thermostat. You've been given a new body so that every room you walk in, brother, sister, that room needs to change. Every room you walk in, 
The new heart and the new body, these hands are no longer about idleness. These hands are hands of blessing. These hands, when, when, when you're in the room, there's no need in the room because you're such a generous person and you don't even, you, you just wanna meet people's needs. You just care about people. You're the kind of person that reaches out and pulls people close. You're the kind of person that when somebody's going through a hard time, you put your arms around people because this is the resurrected you and it's way better than you know. And when you see and when you love, your eyes don't just look at what everybody, it's like embarrassing to see what men look at these days. It's embarrassing. But when, they, when a man's eyes are trained on seeing people for who they are and finding out their value and speaking that value into them, you can change the world. And he says, let me give you a resurrected body where when you walk in the room, the room changes. Anybody else remember a time when you needed the presence of Jesus to step in the room and you didn't know what that meant, you didn't know what that looked like, and you thought it was gonna be Jesus in the heavens with the cloud, but he sent you a person. Don't you wanna be that person? You can't if you're stuck in old you. But if you have your mind set on new you, it's got the Holy Spirit just wants to catalyze that in you. Third thing is a, is a new identity. He just says, uh, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I hope you hear that about yourself. That you or we might declare the praise of him who has called you out of darkness and into his wonderful life. Once you weren't a people, but now, man, you're the people of God. He says, man, I don't want to just change your heart. I don't want to just change your body. I want you to know for sure who you are so that your identity is no longer up for grabs. You are not addicted. You're not a former terrible father. You're not a, like, I don't know what, what's been spoken over you. I don't know the identity that's been given to you. But he says, those titles and those names for that old you, they don't exist anymore. You are mine. And you're a son and you're a daughter. And when you, again, when you step in the room, you carry a title that anybody, that's accessible to anyone. So many people are locked up. We've never seen anxiety and people like so lost in like knowing who they are and they're so confused. And it's like, I wish you knew, like Ephesians says the 30, 30 plus things that happen the moment you're saved, that you're saved, that you're reconciled, that you're bought, that you're adopted, that you're new. Like I wish you knew, I wish people knew who you are, he resurrected you is such a powerful thing. And then fourthly is a new future. He says, set your heart on things above. He says, listen, your old desires won't get you to your new future. And he just, I love Psalm 30, 37, four, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. What does your heart really desire? It's a good question, right? What's your heart really desire? I think one of the things Paul does is something that we, we forget, man. We're trying to live this life and we're trying to hold on to the old because we don't want to miss anything in this lifetime. But he just says, listen, there's, there's a day coming. There's, like we think life is, is the whole deal. Life is, like, life is like a mist. It's like a vapor. It comes and it's gone. He says, I've made you for a whole new future. And when you when you really wrap your mind around the hope of heaven and what that means to be resurrected, then it's just, it just changes things. Because as bad as I wanted to be in that hospital room and to make sure that, every, like, that my son was being cared for and that, that every, like, all my, everything was met the way it needed to be met, there is a desire, growing desire in my soul that when, there is a day coming that I want to look my Savior in the eyes and him say, well done, good and faithful servant. But it's not just that. I want my boys behind me. I want my daughters behind me. I want anybody that's been in their life behind me. I want the parents of my kids, friends to be behind me. I want the people where I go to work out. I want them to be behind me. I want anyone who has ever been in the reach of this person to step into that day and to be found faithful. I, does anything else matter anymore? When that becomes your destination, then all of a sudden, man, all the old desires, they just seem ridiculous, man. And you start being formed into a new person with a new heart and a new body and a new identity with a new set future. So I think the Father would just say to you, friend, put to death. 
through the grace of the cross, you can't do it on your own, and the power of the resurrection by the Holy Spirit. So that your desires can be made new, your heart can be made new, your body and your identity, so your future can be made new, and so you can finally walk in and taste the fullness you were made for. Settle for nothing less. Heavenly Father, God, thank you that we have fullness in Christ. Thank you that you have bought us with your blood. Thank you that you have triumphed over the old self, death, darkness, and by your power and only by your power and because of your grace and only because of your grace, we have an opportunity to be made new, resurrected us, not just then, but now. Father, we pray that our desires would not pull us off the rails, but you would plant new desires and move us to the destination that we all long for. We pray that in a strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, you guys are great, man. Love you. Yeah. Well, let me, um, are you standing for me? Y'all standing for me. That's sweet of you. <laughs> Let's stand and pray. Can we do that? Yeah. Um, if, if um, let me just say this. If, if you're in here and you just, you need help, man. You need a prayer. You need a conversation. Just want to encourage you. There's a prayer team here. Just stay in your seat after this. And they'd love Love to serve you. Grab one of the staff members. We have ama- amazing staff here. They're, up, they're off the charts. Grab one of them. Um, but don't, my encouragement, brother, says don't settle. Don't settle for a destination that is not one you really long for. And don't keep letting the desires, the old desires. And some people say that's a young man's game. And, and some of you in your 60s and 70s know that's not true. You didn't think you'd still be struggling with what you're struggling with and you are. All of us need to put to death the old and step into the new. Believers, non-believers, if you're in the room and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, because I love you, I would say, I don't know how you're waiting. I would encourage you, you need to have a conversation today. And you need to have a conversation, you need to make a decision. I'm not trying to be mean and I'm not trying to be manipulative. I'm trying to be helpful. You need to make a decision for Christ. It's time. How much longer are you going to wait, man? It's today. Do it today. Don't wait. Do it today. Step out of the old, step into the new. We'll, we'll fire that up. I don't know what we need to do. We'll figure it out, man. Step into the new today. Father, I pray over my brothers and sisters a blessing. Help them step out of the old and into the new. Pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. On your way out, you have to either hug or be nice. I'll, this is for you non-huggers. But you got you to notice the people around you. Say hi, hello, hug them, love them. High five if, if you can't take it. Love y'all. Get out of here.